Sam Scarden worked for United States Congressman and civil rights leader John Lewis. Now he works in the business community here in the Low Country and also wants to change the status quo in Columbia. And that's why Sam is running for the South Carolina State Senate District 41 seat. I speak exclusively with Sam for this edition of Quentin's Close Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and download my free Quentin's Close Ups app in your Apple or Google Play stores. And listen to this interview next week on iHeartRadio. Sam Scarden, welcome to Quentin's Close Ups. Thank you for having me, Quinn. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> You're welcome. Anytime. Obviously, and this is coming from your Twitter bio, you are a proud Charlestonian, husband to the amazing Leslie Deer. You are a dad to the adorable doll. <laughs> I am. That's true. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I believe you all just got married. We did. Uh, five weeks ago. Yes. Uh, in yeah. November this year. Right. Yeah. Because I saw you guys last at the Charleston County Democratic Party Blue Jam where I was awarded an yes. award. Congratulations, brother. Well, well, well learned. Well deserved. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And Obviously, you're a candidate to change, quote, the status quo in the South Carolina Senate District 41. Yeah. And if you were in the Democratic primary coming up the next year, you'll go up against the current state senator, Sandy Sin. Why Sam Scarden? Why now? Sure. Uh, well, like I said, thank you for having me first. You're welcome. Uh, let me tell you, and also thank you for what you're doing. <laughs> I, I appreciate, uh, I think you do a great job at it. I think it's a very important thing to hold our leaders and our candidates accountable. So thank you for doing that, Quentin. Uh, I'll tell you a little about myself first. Uh, like you said, I grew up in Charleston, uh, went to our public schools here. Uh, I actually remember missing class because our air conditioners would go out in public schools. And we still are failing our kids in a lot of ways today, in, in ways much worse than, than that one experience I had. But uh, I went on to work in public policy. I worked for President Barack Obama's campaign when well, when he was a senator running for president right. and had a campaign office here in Charleston in the primary. Right. Uh, and then went to Washington, D.C. and worked for Congressman John Lewis, a great hero of the civil rights movement and a great U.S. congressman. For four years, I served on his policy staff. I was uh, Politics and policy are great ways to make a difference in the world, but I was moved to to expand my horizons a little bit and learn the private sector a little better because of the importance and influence it has too in shaping our communities. So I went to business school after Congressman Lewis's office and ever since then I've been kind of blending those two skill sets. I uh, moved back to Charleston, I've been working in uh, at first sustainable long-term economic planning for the region. Uh, so very big picture, long range, uh, how do we make our economy more sustainable, more inclusive, more prosperous for all of us. And then uh, most recently, I've worked in small business lending and helping entrepreneurs who wouldn't otherwise have access to capital uh, be able to chase their dreams and, and get their businesses off the ground. So in each of those areas, uh, there, there are issues at the state house that we need to be doing, that the state of South Carolina could be doing to uh, have better schools, to the, I'll tell you the single biggest barrier to doing business in South Carolina right now for the entrepreneurs I work with for the businesses I was working with when we were doing strategic planning for the region is uh, talented workers, talented workforce coming out of our South Carolina public schools. Uh, infrastructure, the ability to move people and goods to where they need to be to be effective parts of our economy and to be able to share in the prosperity of our economy. Uh, and then building an inclusive economy that means, so if you're working a full-time job here in Charleston, uh, you don't have to work two jobs just to pay your mortgage costs, your rent, or your uh, student loan debt, or your your, your health care bills. Uh, so I think there's a lot our state legislature can and should be doing uh, to make a more inclusive economy, to improve our infrastructure, to improve our education system. Those are the issues I work on every day, and, and why I moved to run and why I hope people uh, will vote for us is because... Our state needs to be doing more on each of those things and they're not right now. A couple of questions ran through my mind while you were talking to me just a second ago. Let me back it up. You talked obviously about, you know, being a public school student and growing up in the public school system. What is your view of the Charleston County School District right now as we sit here? Yes, yeah, so the Charleston County School District is doing a lot. Uh, I think everyone's familiar with uh, a whole package of changes that are being proposed. Right. Some are very controversial. Uh, some are, are better communicated, better thought out than others. Um, I would take a step back and say a couple things about it from a, the perspective of someone running for the state house, not okay. the school board. Um, first of all, I think everything the school board does needs to be outcomes-based. It needs to focus on 
data and research that shows these changes will be good for students and will address some of the biggest issues in our school systems like disparities, uh, like teacher pay, like teacher retention, and then student outcomes. Um, the other thing is they need to be very transparent, very communicative. Obviously, people take their kids' education very seriously and very uh, It's one of the most important things that can happen in your life as a parent. And uh, so the school board needs to be very clear about what they're doing and why they're doing it, and that it is outcomes-based. Uh, that said, the specific proposals that I think a state house can be doing, uh, we need to be funding our schools better, period. And one of the reasons the school district is in kind of all this mess of having to make a lot of very unpopular, very difficult, very tough choices is because they're not getting the funding they need from the state. So that's why you see conversations like about very unpopular conversations sometimes about consolidation or um, privatization or teachers' jobs being at risk for one reason or another. Um, I think we need to hold the state accountable in their role in that. The, this school board is in a very tough position because they simply don't have the funding to run this district the way that a lot of parents and, and teachers want it to be run. You talked earlier about obviously accountability. If you were in the style of South Carolina State House right now as a state senator, and you wrote a, a letter on behalf of many of the other state senators and House representatives about these upcoming changes, what would you write in that letter? I think the three things I laid out are, are the important things. Again, for someone who is not directly on the school board or running for the school board, but I think the guidelines that the school board should be operating by are transparency. People need to know why these decisions are being made, when and how they're being made. Uh, they need to be extremely communicative. They, they need to tell people what's going to happen, what is happening, and why it happened. And then uh, they need to tie everything they're doing to, to outcomes. You know, if it might be an unpopular change, but if it's because they believe this will create better education for students in South Carolina public schools, then they need to tell people that um, so that we, we can remember what we're all here for, which is to improve student outcomes. Outcomes. Is the Charleston County School District physically responsible in your mind? Well, like I said, I, I think that the state bears some responsibility here for putting them in this position. Uh, you have to make really difficult decisions and you have to do some unpopular things when you don't have the funding to do everything you need to do and everything you want to do. So, um, you know, I, I think the board, and I've worked with the board directly on a few issues. Uh, I'm a graduate of the Academic Magnet High School. In fact, when I was at the, the Magnet, uh, it was a very diverse school. We had a, our population was about 60-65% white students and about 35% non-white students. Uh, in the 15 years since I was there, the school has uh, dropped down to, at one point, only 2% black students and I think now it's back up to 4 or 5% black students. Uh, that's something I'm very concerned about. Our class, which is very diverse, very concerned about. Uh, so we formed a working group to work with the, the school district on addressing some of those issues. Uh, so I think there needs to be a lot of community input in what the school district's doing, uh, and we need to be moving in the direction of, of more equity, more uh, more inclusive educational opportunities in South Carolina. Can we go back again to the Charleston County School District? Sure. With all of these issues that are going on, you know, school choices, you know, closing schools, opening schools, are they really transparent? I certainly think there's some people who would say they aren't. Um, again, I'm not running for the school board, so I, I don't, um, I don't want to get too into the weeds of their decision making and their process. Um, I do think clearly there's a, a large contingent of community members and parents who feel that they haven't been totally transparent, and I understand that, and that's why I think you know from a state legislative perspective, what we, the, our state leaders can do is better fund our districts to not put them in a position like this, and then encourage more transparency and more uh, communication from, from the district, and then make sure whatever they're doing is outcomes-based. Well, if you become a state senator right now, how much money would you be bringing back to District 41? That's a great question, Quinn. Uh, the, you probably know this better than just about anybody, but the funding formula for South Carolina public schools is a mess. Uh, it's incredibly complex, and then we have this law called Act 388, which essentially prevents local school districts from even solving the problem themselves. Uh, it prevents them from using local property taxes to fund schools, which almost every state, especially states with good student outcomes, do. Um, so, yeah, I think from a from a perspective of 
what do we pay in and what do we bring back to the district, like your question was about. Right now, Charleston County is paying, paying in a substantial amount. It's only getting back about uh, 36% of what it sends to the state. So I think the funding formula is something that should be addressed. And then it also sh the funding formula should be fully met. So again, you might know this, but the South Carolina legislature right now is in contempt of the South Carolina Supreme Court for not funding public schools at the level they set themselves. They passed a law that said we're going to fund at this level, and they haven't met that level. They got taken to court over it, and the state Supreme Court said, yeah, you're, you're violating your own funding law. Uh, so I think we, we need to be bringing back substantially more district, more money to the district, certainly more than the 36% that Charleston County is paying in right now and, and getting back. I know you're not running for the Charleston County School Board. Sure. <laughs> you know, well, I love talking about education. Right? <laughs> it is the most important issue in the state. And like I said, I've, I've worked with some of the biggest companies in Charleston. I've worked with some of the smallest entrepreneurs in Charleston. Yeah. And every single one of them says our biggest challenge is workforce. It's finding qualified employees, find, finding talented employees coming out of Charleston County Schools. And so as a community, as a district, as a school board, as a state, we all need to be working towards improving our educational outcomes here. Let me pick a part of your Twitter bio. And what you, sure, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. you say you want to change the status quo in Columbia, particularly for yeah. District 41. Mm -hmm. If you were elect elected state senator, how would you change the status quo at 75 Calhoun Street? Well, you said I'm running for the state legislature, <laughs> not the school board. <laughs> um, I, I think, and this is true on a, a number of issues in addition to education, what the state legislature can do is, you know, it's a, obviously our state government is very large, much larger than county governments and, and school boards. Uh, so what we can really do is set the guidelines uh, in the state legislature. We can uh, in, it implement some transparency mechanisms, some uh, requirements about communication and, and having outcomes-based policy changes or, or publishing the outcomes you're trying to achieve. Um, so... Yeah, I think those are the things the state legislature could do um, without getting involved in the weeds on every single proposal. Uh, I noticed on a few infrastructure projects too uh, throughout our district, uh, infrastructure, economic development projects, uh, I think a lot of people tend to try to get focused on the details of each one. And again, from the state legislature perspective, I think there's some good guidelines we can put in place uh, if, on both our schools and our uh, infrastructure, economic development projects, you name it, our environmental efforts uh, that then will hopefully improve the, the county and city. You talk about those uh, efforts. You talk about infrastructure projects. I have to talk to you about 526 and the completion of it. Sure. Is it dead or alive in your mind? Oh, I think it's very alive. And I think, uh, in fact, I think it's essentially a done deal. I think the, the question at this point is, is not so much if it happens, but uh, when it happens and if we do it right. Okay. So, you know, the state infrastructure bank voted to fund the project this past year. Uh, the county funding is in place to have some sales tax. I mean, the, this project is extremely likely going to happen. Uh, I think it should happen, but I think it's very important we do it right. And the biggest thing in my mind is that it not just be a road. It, it'd, be, it'd also it'd be a complete street. So it'd be bike friendly, pedestrian friendly, have capacity for mass transit when we're ready to add it. So we don't face the same situation like we did on the Ashley River recently where we're trying to correct the mistakes of several generations ago in not being more visionary and more thoughtful about how we do infrastructure in the state. If you add more sidewalks and bike lanes and whatnot to the 526 project, how much would that cost? Yeah, it would cost more. Uh, the Ashley River Bridge, for example, cost about $18 million. That was the grant was recently received. Uh, this bridge would be probably three or four times longer than that. So it would be a substantial expenditure but again i think it's important we do it right because if we don't i think what's going to happen is years from now we're going to have to spend even more money to fix it uh, like we're doing in the ashley river bridge um so i think it's worth the investment now the state has this 1.8 billion dollar surplus uh, which i think almost all of it should go towards the issues we've talked about education infrastructure uh, equitable economic development uh, and environmental protection uh, but they have this money on hand and I think it gives us an opportunity to do things right and uh, we shouldn't miss that opportunity by trying to save a penny or two here or there. What is the state of environmental protection in District 41 in your mind? Yeah, absolutely. So we have we have major flooding issues. Uh, I experience them regularly. Uh, I sit in the traffic regularly that in the often is caused by environmental issues. I know people whose homes are affected by flooding on a regular basis. Our neighbors, our friends. So uh, 
we need to invest in flooding infrastructure. Obviously, we need to uh, have more drainage projects. There were some of them were identified in the Dutch Dialogue study that the City of Charleston did. Uh, some of them are being funded by the state right now. Even things down to ditch clearing. I mean, uh, ditch clearing along state-owned roads is can be a bureaucratic mess, and uh, we need to be better about that and, and infrastructure projects that will mitigate flooding. Let's step back and talk about the bigger picture issue, though. This is happening because sea levels are riding, rising. Sea levels are rising because our climate is changing. And South Carolina should be a leader in fighting climate change. There are a lot of things we can do on it. One is uh, we operate several coal fired power plants right now. We have an opportunity to divest from those. Uh, those, money, those plants are actually losing money, uh, but we keep them online because we don't have a way to replace them. So we should work on replacing them by making things like wind and solar power more viable. Um, and then uh, we talked about complete streets, mass transit, right. bike, pedestrian. Our State Department of Transportation hardly invests a dime in those things. Uh, it is so frustrating. I live on a street where I would love to walk down the, and my wife Wesley and, and our dog Stuart, we would love to walk down the street to the farmer's market, to some of the restaurants and breweries, grocery stores that are near us, but nearly impossible to access without a car because the, it's so unsafe to just walk down the street or try to cross the street near our house. So uh, that's bad environmental policy, because that means we gotta take a car trip every single time we wanna go somewhere. So complete streets are, are good infrastructure policy, they're good environmental policy, uh, and they give our state an opportunity, like I said, along with divesting from some coal plants, to really be a leader in fighting climate change, which is the root cause of that flooding we're talking about. How many coal plants are you talking? I know there are two, uh, Specifically owned by Santee Cooper, which is you know obviously going to be an issue for the legislature in the next session, um, and then there's several more operated around the state as well. As well, you talked earlier, obviously, about the Department of Transportation. Where is your confidence level when it comes to the Department of Transportation, particularly in District 41? Uh, so, my that's the interesting phrase is confidence level. I'm very confident in their ability to build roads. They do that a lot. Uh, we have. Uh, we have the fourth most state-owned roads of any state in the U.S. in South Carolina. Uh, the Department of Transportation loves building roads, and there are, we do need road projects. You know, we've talked about 526, which is entirely in our district. Uh, we need road projects, but we need to have more than just a Department of Roads. We need a Department of Transportation, and that includes mass transit, bikeability, walkability. Uh, some of the most innovative projects in South Carolina in those fields right now, uh, the Low Country Rapid Transit proposal, right. South Carolina's first mass transit system, right now is being funded entirely with local and federal dollars. There's not a dime from the state in it. Same with Ashley River Bridge. Everyone's celebrating. In fact, uh, Leslie and I just came from a celebration of the Ashley River Bridge being completed. Right. We're celebrating a federal grant, uh, and the city is putting up some money too, but there's no... There's no state money in it. It's because our State Department of Transportation doesn't think holistically about complete streets, about mobility options rather than just driving and roads options. Well, if you were in the state center right now, what type of funds would you propose for completing, obviously, the Ashley River Bridge? Yeah, well, I think it's in a. So the Ashley River Bridge, like I said, is, is fully funded, although there, there, there's first a lot of projects need more funding down the road at some point. So it's foreseeable that the state can and should jump in on that. Uh, I think if. You know, $18 million in a state that right now has a $1.8 billion surplus isn't a whole lot of money. And I think it's very important that we we treat the, the surplus we have now as an opportunity to invest in the things that are important to South Carolina in the 21st century. So that means, like I said, better schools and using some of that money on more innovative transportation projects. Projects. Mm -hmm. Let me get back to, and you talk obviously about projects. Yeah. I want to go back to 526 yeah. again, because obviously there's a big controversy over how the half cent sales tax was used. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was it used legally in your mind? Well, I'm not a judge. Uh, I'm, I'm a small businessman. Uh, we, we do small business lending. My understanding, and, and this is the argument I'm, I believe in, is that uh, the county did have the flexibility to use those funds for other projects as necessary. Uh, my understanding is that clears them to use the money for 526. Uh, I don't know every legal detail. Like I said, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a judge, so we are probably the ones who decide that case. Uh, but my understanding of the issue is that the county certainly had some flexibility and, and they're using it now. Do you actually, in your mind, support flyovers, particularly at Maine and River Roads? I think, so I'd want to see the details of each project. Uh, 
what I, I believe, again, we talked about the state setting guidelines, and uh, rather than the state becoming involved in the nitty gritty details of every project, I think we got to engage our communities. So when we talk about infrastructure, I think that the things are the things we should think about are was the community engaged? Is it more than just a road? Is it bike pedestrian friendly? Is it public transit friendly? Um, and if, if an infrastructure project meets those criteria, the community is supportive of it, uh, then I think the state should be too. Too. You talked earlier, obviously, about environmental protection. Where are you with offshore drilling? Oh, completely against it. I, I think it's a, an incredible environmental risk. Uh, like you said, we've talked about some 21st century issues here, moving our, our economy forward, our infrastructure forward. Uh, there's so many, you know, we're building electric cars up in Berkeley County at the Volvo plant. Uh, in addition to being a terrible environmental risk and a huge threat to our local economy and our, our wonderful environment here, uh, it's also just investment in 20th century infrastructure. We should be investing in 21st century infrastructure. Infrastructure. Yeah. You talk about obviously, you know, strengthening the economy. How would you do that as senator? That's a great question. Hey, that's what I, that's what I wake up doing every day. Uh, like I said, I work with entrepreneurs and we try to help them achieve their dreams. Uh, we're a nonprofit, so we are, we're mission driven. Our goal is to get capital and access to capital to people who wouldn't otherwise get it, uh, and so they can share in the prosperity that Charleston's experienced recently. Um, it ten, that tends to be women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, and veteran-owned businesses. Now, uh, that's almost that's a huge majority of the clients we lend to, uh, and I can tell you from an economic perspective, the things that matter to them: uh, healthcare costs, uh, healthcare access is one of the biggest issues to someone becoming an entrepreneur because they're afraid to give up whatever plan they had in their previous job to go, go out on their own and start their business. Or it's the, the biggest barrier to hiring someone because maybe they have a spouse whose healthcare plan they're on, but all of a sudden when that business becomes responsible for providing healthcare for the next person, um, it becomes a huge concern and, and barrier to a business's growth. So healthcare is one, I'd say, uh, housing costs are another economic issue we have in our region. Uh, so we, our average incomes over the last, like I said, economic issues are my, my wheelhouse. So I'm going to talk your ear off with some stats here. <laughs> uh, our average income over the last decade is up 12%. Okay. That's pretty good. 12% income growth. That, that's good. Uh, our average home sale price is up 27%. It's going up twice as fast as the average income. And then our average rental cost is up 49%. So that's going up four times as fast as the average income. So for every dollar in a raise, your, your, every dollar your income has grown over the past decade, your rent's probably gone up $4. That's not sustainable. And what's happening is people who are hardworking, who work 40, 50 hour, 60 hour weeks, still struggle with making down payment on a house, with covering costs of rent, uh, with their student loan debt, uh, which I struggle with myself, and, uh, and healthcare costs. So that's what I talk about when we're talking about an inclusive economy, okay. is uh, people sharing in our region's prosperity enough that hardworking people aren't dealing with those costs every day, especially small businesses and entrepreneurs who are trying to get their businesses off the ground. You know, that's not a barrier to them becoming successful and building wealth in their own communities and families. This is a question I've been asking a lot of people. You've probably heard about it in, in my recent Quentin Stolzup's interviews. But the question is this, is it affordable housing? Or is attainable housing or workforce housing in your mind? Take pick, call it whatever you want. We need we need housing people can afford and know you put whatever label you want on it, but if someone's uh, you know, working their butts off, uh, trying to provide for their family, uh, they should be able to live near where they work. It's a big issue, that's one of the biggest contributors to traffic in the Charleston area, is this this housing crisis we have uh, has separated uh, jobs from people who are working those jobs. So you're talking about hour plus long commutes, 20, 30, 40 mile commutes, because someone who's working on James Island in our district might not be able to afford to live there. They might have to commute from Ridgeville or they might have to commute from out in Dor up in northern Dorchester County. Uh, the longer that car is on the road, the more it's contributing to traffic. And so that's um, affordable housing becomes an infrastructure issue too. And so I, I say affordable housing, you take call it whatever you want to call it, but we need people to be able, we need hardworking people to be able to afford to live near where they work. Work. You talk about this housing crisis. How do we get here? It's a good question. So uh, we've had a very prosperous economy, and, and like I said, I talk about an inclusive economy. Where and what I mean by that is this prosperity is felt and shared by everybody. So we have this growing income disparity in in Charleston County and in South Carolina and in America. Really, uh, we're not unique in this problem. 
but there are elements that uh, we can do and we can ensure that when we approve new housing, new things in Charleston, that they have affordability components to them. Uh, one of the biggest projects near our district is the Epic Center over at, uh, with the proposed redevelopment of Citadel Mall. Um, it's got to have strong affordability components. That, that we talk, it, keep going back to this theme of the state legislators, le legislature setting guidelines rather than getting involved in nitty gritty details. A guideline should be affordability. And actually, our state legislature has done the opposite. They've banned inclusionary zoning in South Carolina, which I understand uh, it can be controversial, but uh, that's a step away from affordability. And, and the guidelines for everything we do new in this state should be a move toward being more inclusive and more affordable. And what parts of it is non-controversial that you would support? There's a lot of stuff the state can do on affordable housing that is less controversial. So there's this is some... Uh, yeah, we're talking about economic issues, Quentin. This is this is my thing. Uh, so uh, there's something called the uh, there's federal affordable housing tax credits, uh, and what it is, the federal government gives money to the states who then distribute to different uh, affordable housing efforts in their states. Most states match that. Uh, so there's federal money. It's not a ton of federal money. Uh, but most states will go dollar for dollar with the federal government and we'll put two dollars for one dollar federal government does or something. Okay. South Carolina doesn't do that right now. There are proposals to do it. Senator Kimson has a proposal to do it right now, um, Senator from the 42nd District. Uh, I would support those efforts and I think that's a, a very important, much less controversial, but still very important thing we could do to make housing more affordable in Charleston. More affordable. Obviously, we talk about what cost is doing this particular interview. Let me go back to health care because yeah. With the rising health care costs in the state and around the country, how much money do we have in the budget for that to help those citizens, particularly in District 41? Yeah, exactly. Well, so there's a lot of different health care components. Health care policy is very complex. Like I said, I'm sure you know all the many moving parts of it. Uh, one thing that we're doing right now is we're leaving money on the table from the federal government. Uh, we could expand Medicaid as part of the Affordable Care Act. Every state has the option to do that. And the federal government will pay up, upwards of 90% of the costs associated with it. Because there are 164,000 uninsured South Carolinians right now. Almost every single one of them would be eligible for coverage if we expanded Medicaid. Uh, and we don't even need a budget to do it because we just need to say, okay, federal government, please come help us with this problem. And they're willing to pick up a lot of the tab on it. Uh, so there, you don't need to dramatically spend more money in South Carolina. There are things you could do. Um, but when I come back to that Medicaid expansion is the, the most obvious thing that we just have to say yes someone's offering to help and we got to just say okay please let's do it how do you convince that to Governor McMaster that's a good question I think that's why we need to change status quo in Columbia what is that right now <laughs> status quo is is turning down one of the most helpful hands it's trying to bite the hand that feeds us and uh, you know, there are South Carolinians who need that access to health care and the status quo is to, to essentially say no because they don't like the person who passed the law in the federal government. And uh, I don't think that's a reason we should be hurting South Carolinians or denying them access to health care. Let me stay on communication. If you were to be elected to the state Senate, how would you communicate with your constituents? That's a great question, Quentin. So I'll go back to my days working for Congressman John Lewis up in Washington, D.C. Uh, my first job for him was answering his mail. Oh. Uh, it was very interesting. I was 22 years old. I got hired for kind of a low-level policy job. I'd, anytime someone wrote him about an issue, you know, what do you think about this? What do you, how did you vote on that? My job was to do the research to help him respond to those those letters. Okay. Uh, and the thing that he taught me very early on is uh, people need to be engaged with their legislators. Uh, they need to feel like they can get a thorough, thoughtful answer and they can be part of a conversation in policy making. So that's what I did for first couple of years I worked for him, and a very important headset you put on that is that you're not just providing information, you're not just answering a letter, but you're bringing someone into the conversation and being part of the, the policy making process. And that's what I think people deserve from their legislators. That's that's the job of legislators is to um, represent people and, and by definition that means communicating well with them and, and conversing regularly with them. If you were in the state senate, <laughs> I'm using this redundantly. Yeah, sure. But if you were in the state senate right now, obviously we're around a pre-filing bill time. Yeah. What would you pre-file for District 41 right now, if you could? Sure. Well, we've talked about a lot of ideas that I think are really important. Uh, so I'll talk about something we haven't talked about yet, and that's four-year-old kindergarten in South okay. Carolina. Uh, we talked. We let off talking about education. It's still an issue I'm most passionate about um, in terms of what I think this state needs to move forward. And four-year-old kindergarten again. Let's go to outcomes-based. 
uh, programs, outcome-based efforts. There's all kinds of data out there that says if you can get a child in three-year-old, four-year-old kindergarten, they come to kindergarten more prepared, and then they do better on their first standardized tests in third grade, and then they do better on their standardized tests in high school, and then they are much more job-ready, college-ready, life-ready. So I think in addition to the many things we've talked about, I think four-year-old kindergarten is one of the most important things we could do. Our neighbors do it. Georgia has universal four-year-old kindergarten. Uh, Florida has universal four-year-old kindergarten. And uh, in South Carolina, there are 88,000 three- and four-year-olds that don't have access to four-year-old kindergarten right now that I think uh, I would consider it a failure of a first term unless we make progress on that. Progress. Yeah. Let me go to yesterday. Obviously, yeah. you've seen, seen it on Twitter. <laughs> it's former governor and obviously former United States yeah. to the Union Ambassador Nikki Haley versus State Senator Marlon Kimson over Nikki Haley's interview about the Confederate flag and Dylan Roof. Mm -hmm. What would you be your message right now to Nikki Haley if you could tell her? It's an interesting question. Uh, so, I, like I said, worked for Congressman John Lewis. Um, honored my life to work for someone who was so closely involved in the civil rights movement. Um, right, a second honor in my life after marrying Leslie over there a few weeks ago. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> um, I think when we talk about issues of race and uh, symbols and statues and, and race and civil rights in America, uh, people have to be very thoughtful, very come in with open minds, open hearts, open ears. Um, the comments by former Governor Haley uh, and Ambassador Haley didn't strike me as in that tone. Uh, I do remember when, when the flag came down, being very impressed with her leadership on that issue uh, and being very impressed with the leadership of the legislature and Senator Kimson as well. Um, I think we need to continue that openness and dialogue. And I, I, I think she... she I'm not sure that the, her recent comments were in line with that, and, and I would hope she realizes that and, and realizes that we have many deep racial scars in, in South Carolina and America. We need to be incredibly thoughtful. We need to be willing to learn, willing to listen, um, willing to work together on addressing them. Sam Scarden, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome to Quentin's Close-Ups. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you. We'll see you back soon. Oh, definitely will. Good to see you. Yes, sir. Thanks.